in sixth grade or under, you can head this direction. Mr. Roberto will walk you over to class. You guys are going to have a ton of fun. Parents will come get you in a minute. And for the rest of you, happy Easter. Mm, this side's awake. Happy Easter over here. He is risen. Ah, pretty awesome. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a funny custom that we see in the church. We don't say it a lot these days. If you're new to church or you're a younger member of the church, if you noticed when I said, watch this, watch this. Are you guys ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah, what a funny custom. Dying eggs, getting all dressed up for church, all these things we do when Easter comes around. And there's a buzz in the air. There's an energy, an electricity. Something's happening. Something cool, something great, something. And it's not unlike the very first Easter in the Bible. Now, of course, it wasn't called Easter. It was called Passover. And the custom of the time is for all of the Jewish people who are living around in different countries, in different cities, they would pack up their families, pack up some food, pack up some livestock, and they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with all of their families. And so there's a buzz in the air as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. What's interesting is There's also political unrest, extreme political unrest, because the Romans are occupying Jerusalem. And we all know the Romans were super peaceful, great guys, man of the year status. They're brutal. And they're oppressing the Israelite people, the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are looking for a savior. They're looking for a king. And they're not just wishfully looking. They are actively looking, anticipating, monitoring the young men of the time to see, are you the chosen one? Are you the one that the prophecy was spoken about? This is not unlike many of the movie tropes we have. You know, think Harry Potter, think Star Wars, think The Hobbit, where this unsuspecting person is born and they start to show some amazing skills. And it dawns on the people that are around them, hey, this might be the guy. So you might be wondering why they would be doing this. Well, if we read the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament. Daniel of Daniel and the lion's den, if you know some of your Bible stories. One of the last visions he has in his life is a vision of the Redeemer coming to free the Jewish people 483 years after the rebuilding of the temple. And so because it is Jewish custom to read the Torah, to know the prophecies, to memorize these things, people are waiting with bated breath to know who is it going to be? Who's coming to deliver us? And not deliver us like we understand the story, but deliver us from the oppression of the Jews, of the Romans. They're thinking gladiator status. They're thinking this guy's going to come in, eyes blazing, hair wild. He's going to start slicing and dicing. He's going to push out the Romans and the Jewish people are going to be free and they're going to have their own king and they're going to be able to to worship him in freedom and have a life that's just ah, peaceful. And so they're waiting and they're looking for a king. What's interesting is if we read the scripture and if we read historical documents, we can find that there were multiple saviors that were popping up from different tribes, different sects of the community, and people would flock to them. 
thinking, this is the guy. We are going to pledge our allegiance to him. And so Jesus comes on the scene and he appears to be just another one of those guys. And he's doing miracles. He's healing people. Blind men can see, lame men can walk. In the book of John, there's a story about the feeding of the 5,000. You might know it. And if you don't, let me read this to you. But before I do, I want you to pay close attention to the response of the Jewish people that are following Jesus. And a large crowd was following Jesus because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, hey, where do we buy some bread so that we could feed these people? He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. And Jesus goes on to feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two loaves of fish. I'm going to jump down. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, don't miss this. They said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. This indeed is the prophet who is supposed to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to be their king, Jesus withdrew to the mountain to be by himself. That's how sure they were of Jesus being the conquering king, being the deliverer from the Romans. They were so sure, so full of angst to get rid of the Romans. They were going to take Jesus by force and make him be king. And Jesus withdraws to the mountains. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't always live up to our expectations? See, the other saviors of the world, of the Jewish party, were trying to gather as many people to them as they could. Because with a big enough army, you could overthrow the Romans. And Jesus doesn't want to be king the way they want him to be king. He'll be king on his own time. And so he retreats to the mountains and he skirts their expectations. A year later, Jesus is arriving back on the scene at Jerusalem with his disciples. And in the year that's passed from the feeding of the 5,000 to the present, Jesus has been doing even more miracles saving people's lives, healing lepers, delivering people, healing Lazarus. He's doing amazing things. And so his group of people that believe in him have not diminished. They have only gotten stronger. And so when Jesus arrives to Jerusalem, there is a crowd of people flocking to the gates to see this miracle man. And he's brought a donkey and he rides in to the city on this donkey, an animal reserved for kings. Or rather, when a king would enter a city, a king of peace entering his city, he would ride a donkey. Conquering king, come blazing in on a horse. But they don't get that. It goes right over their heads. And these people are flocking to him. 
and they're so pumped, they're so jazzed that he's coming. Not only is he coming, but he's coming to rescue them. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Here he is, the guy we think should be king. He's on his way. He's going to deliver us. He's going to rescue us. This is about to be the greatest thing you've ever seen. Put on your belts, boys. It's, we're getting fired up. And so they're throwing palm trees down as he comes in. They're taking off their jackets. They're laying them at, the, at his feet. They want him to see him. Lord, I want this guy to know I'm on your side. I pledge my allegiance to you. Don't worry. Don't, don't destroy me. I'm with you. And they are so excited. They are so excited for what they believe is about to happen. And a few days later, Jesus is rested in the middle of night. And he's taken to the courts. And people hear about this and they're stirred up. And so they're flocking to the courts to see what is this miracle man going to do. And the incredible thing about Jesus is as he's standing there and the Sanhedrin is looking at him, all the judges and all these people who believe in him and don't believe in him to be the Savior are standing around. And Jesus does the most amazing thing. He breaks off the shackles. He draws a sword. He cuts a man's ear off. He tosses one to Peter. They kick down the doors. They run out. They're like, yes, we're going to defeat the Romans. At least that's what they wanted to happen. It's not how the story goes. Jesus stands there, accused. It is nothing. They conjure up lies about him, and he does nothing. His disciples abandon him. He does nothing. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns and they press it into his skull so it's bleeding down his face and he does nothing. They walk him through the city. They spit on him. He does nothing. And then they drive crude stakes through the fleshy parts of his arm and his feet. And he does nothing? Put yourself in their shoes. This guy that I thought was the savior, he's doing miracles for three years. And he's standing there, what a wimp. What a wuss. What a bust. He fooled me. I thought he was going to rescue us. I thought he was going to rescue me. I thought he was going to save me. I thought he was going to save my family. I thought he was going to heal me. I thought he was going to heal my family. I thought he would be there for me. And this guy has done nothing. If he was really the savior... If he was really capable of miracles, he would get himself down off of there and strike these people dead. And he stays. And he's looking over the crowd. Thousands of people. are shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That's not my guy, crucify him. I hate that guy. That guy embarrassed me. That guy didn't give me what I wanted, crucify him. And Jesus is up on the cross. And he says, Looking out all over all these people who have abandoned him, even the closest of the close. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And 
And I'm telling you, if it's me, I say get rid of them all. Just get rid of them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How could they possibly not know what they do? You know what I'm saying? Like they doing what they do. They doing what they plan to do. They plotted it out. They executed and they doing it. The Pharisees wanted this guy gone. The Pharisees did not like Jesus. The people who are supposed to be upholding the scripture, the people who are supposed to be understanding of the love of God and extending that love to whomever they crossed were the most exclusive group among them. Don't come, don't bring your sin over here. You're not good enough. So they didn't like Jesus because Jesus loved everybody. And by everybody, I mean everybody. Even the Pharisees. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's interesting, Jesus is really chatty on the cross. If you study it, he actually says a lot. And one of the first things he says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me in my hour of need? Have you ever felt that way? That God has abandoned you in your hour of need when life is at its heaviest, when people are at their worst, and you expect God to show up. And he doesn't come. He doesn't rescue you. He doesn't lift your load. And it feels that way. And it feels like God has abandoned me. And Jesus feels the weight of that. He feels like there is a huge separation. But God never leaves us and he never forsakes us. And he's with Jesus in that moment. And I believe that statement is in there because it helps us understand that Jesus is fully human. What a more human thing to say. God has abandoned me. Only a human feels that weightiness of God leaving when God never leaves. And so Jesus is fully human. And one of the last things he says is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is fully God. Because how could you look at somebody who was with you for three years and they totally de deny your existence when push comes to shove? When the very people you came to rescue and to love shout, crucify him, crucify him. And so we see that this journey between human and holy is a journey of endurance. It is a journey of obedience. And it is a journey of faith. And because of Christ, it's a journey that we are all invited to take. You see, Jesus was living out the very thing that the Jewish people came to town to celebrate. 
They came to town to celebrate the Passover. And tradition tells us in the Old Testament, when Moses was leading his people out of Egypt, that the last plague that God put on the people was that the the spirit would pass through the land and kill the firstborn of any household that did not have the blood of the lamb put on the doorposts. And so the people would sacrifice a lamb, they would take hyssop, they would dump, dump it in the blood, and they would paint it over the, the doorpost. And then the family would enter inside, and they would huddle for safety. And what's interesting, if we do a word study, this word Passover comes from the Hebrew word Pesach which means to stand. And so what scripture says is that the Lord Pesach, he stood in front of the door while the destroyer passed through the land, taking the firstborn from every household that did not have the blood of the lamb slain and wiped over the doorposts. And the people of Jerusalem are looking at the cross and they don't understand this is it. He has laid his body out. He is standing there at the doorway to heaven. He is saying, my blood has been spilled for you and death will not come here. See, Jesus stands at the gate where heaven and hell meet. And he says, not today, Satan. My people are safe. You can't touch them. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I have to offer my forgiveness for those of you who want to come in. And who gets forgiveness? Everybody. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not just them. Not just them. Everyone. Because God loved everyone. And so we see that he stands on the cross ready for you to come into the Lord's house. And he says, my father's house has many mansions and I am going away to prepare a place for you. For you for you. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus dies, gives up his spirit willingly to the Lord, and he is buried. And three days later, they go to the tomb, they roll it back, and he's not there. He is empty. He has risen. It is a great day. And this is why we celebrate Easter. Because he's risen. And the cool thing about God is he doesn't miss a beat. Because he could have gone to heaven. But he doesn't. He comes back. He shows himself to the people that loved him. Why? Hope. Hope is the light of the world. Hope that no matter what we have done or will do, he will stand in front of you and say, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. We all need hope. My question to you is, do you still have Jesus up on the cross? Is he not meeting your expectations? 
Is he not writing the story that you want him to write? Is he not performing the way you think he should perform? Because this world has trouble. It's not a great place to be. But Jesus has opened the door for us to be in heaven with him. And that's a miracle. I want to ask you to stand. If you don't know Jesus, the way that I hope I know Jesus, and if you're not in love with him, which I know can sound like a girly term, but gosh, if somebody dies for you, it's not a greater love than that. It's time you ask Jesus into your heart. It's time you walk through the door and stand under his protection. And it doesn't mean that bad things aren't gonna happen. It just means that someday we get to be in heaven and there are no bad things in heaven. And if you already love Jesus, maybe you still have him on the cross anyway. Because his journey is hard. It is a hard journey from human to holy. And if you're anything like me, you tend to put him back up there more than you'd like. And so I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. And I want you to pray out loud because we shouldn't pray alone. And if you don't like praying out loud, you need to get over that. Because it's just us. There's no judgment here, there's no condemnation, nobody. Nobody cares anything more than everything for you.